So as everyone, um, as I introduced myself in the beginning, my name is Deepa Shrikantaya, and I'm a senior education and research specialist here at World Learning, and I focus a lot on STEM education as well as math education. Next slide. Right. So I thought initially, since it's been, um, you know, two hours already, almost a little bit more than two hours, I thought we could do a, a reflection activity together. And when we talk about community engagement, we're talking about the communities that we're working with. Sometimes it's our backyard, or as Peter mentioned, sometimes we go to different countries and we have to understand the population or the groups that we're working with in different countries. So what I'd like to do usually when I go to a different location, or even if I'm working in my own backyard or with people that I'm very familiar with, is to do a small reflection. Think about what is it that's in my surroundings that I need to reflect on that I could potentially use in my programming. And this is a mindfulness activity. It has, it's not necessarily related to STEM education, but I do this with a lot of participants as well as students or teachers, whom, whoever I'm working with before we start a session, because it really helps to kind of center or focus participants into the conversation that we're going to have. So I'd like to introduce this to you, but at the same time, we can all do it together. So I like to call it five, four, three, two, one. And it's quite simple, so everybody can just do this, um, you know, on your own. And I'll read read the instructions to you. So the first thing is, think about five things that you see around you. Think about four things that you feel, and it can also be clothing on your body or, you know, your hair, uh, if you're wearing any jewelry, or you could even be the ground underneath your feet or shoes. Think about three things that you hear right now. Think about two things that you smell. And think about one thing that you taste in your mouth right now. Okay, so I hope that everyone um, was able to go through this exercise and you feel a bit more grounded in where you're located uh, right now. This is a really nice activity to do when you're in the same room with everybody because oftentimes people see the same things or they feel the same things. Um, you know, they might be sitting on similar chairs or they hear similar uh, noises around them, things like that. So it kind of, it helps to connect people in a group together. But what I've also noticed that since we're working virtually now and we're in different locations, this type of activity also helps us to stay connected because even though we're not in the same location, we are sitting from our rooms or our offices wherever we're working from, but we're, um, connecting almost all the surroundings around us to the rest of the participants. So this is a nice way to get everybody on the same page. And if you are in a different location, whether you're in a school setting or if you're working in a, you know, community center, or if you're working even with a government or whoever, wherever location you are, it's just a nice way to get everybody on the same page. So I wanted to share that um, reflection or that mindfulness exercise. All right. So, based on the presentations that we've had thus far with Mohammed as well as with Peter, I wanted to just ask everybody here, what does the term community mean to you? Uh, what is what is the definition of community? And you can put it into the chat box. And I think I can see the chat. And see the chat. 
I know it's been a long session already, but hopefully we have still a little bit of energy <laughs> to um, for um, just to go through a couple of these slides and get an um, understanding of community engagement. Thank you, Binod. Com um, Binod says it's a community of practice working in the same areas. Yeah, that's a good that's a good definition. Anybody else? It can be one word. It, it doesn't even have to be a full definition. If you want to describe a color or anything, yeah, people together, Justin, that's very good. People together. It could also be an image, you know, if you, if you think of an image of a community working together. Okay, I think I missed one right before. Um, yes. Marbella says a community is generally a group of people who have common goals and often work towards them for their area of expertise. Yeah, very good. Maybe no, thank you. Who share similar practices culture? Yeah, very good. Adline says common context and set of experiences. Great. Anybody else? How about two more responses and then we'll move on? These are all really great. Paula says a group of people with a common goal. Yeah, very good. Can we get one more? Even if you want to unmute yourselves, you can you can also say it out loud. You don't have to necessarily type it in the chat. Um, with the learning. Common needs for learning. Thank you, Golnara. Yeah, exactly. Very good. I think I'm sorry, one of the reasons my staff is not working. That's okay. No worries. You can always unmute yourselves if you need to um, respond to anything. So one of the reasons why I wanted to do this activity is that as we think about the definitions or anything that we that we um, are working with, if we think about the definitions that we come in with, that's very important in any type of community work that we do or any type of international work that we do because we're coming with our perspectives or our worldviews to the to the programming and to the work that we're doing. And even though, you know, we have an underlying, they're all very similar, we're also defining community um, a bit differently with different words. And that's also important too. And it's not that one answer is um, uh, more correct or, you know, better than another, but they're all equally important and for us to kind of have this discussion. So it's, you know, thinking about, you know, how we can all be connected with each other. What are the different, um, you know, cultural experiences, practices that we have, what are um, differences that we have that we can also bring together. So these are all different ideas of what community is. And I just wanted um, all of you to reflect on that before we started. So if we look at a community um, ecosystem, a community can also be considered an ecosystem. And if you think about this person, this stick figure in the middle, it can be um, any gender, any race, any person that you know is learning stem education there's different things in their community that can influence them so for example like community as it's one of them but really you know their home environments you know who are what type of education levels their parents might have what languages they speak at home what resources they have access to what type of school that they go to are they um going to a government school or a public school are they going to a private school do they also have access to after school programs? Do they have access to resources like libraries or other, um, you know, uh, I guess educational centers around them? Do they also have access to museums or science centers, you know, to enrich their learning? And then, you know, just kind of thinking beyond, you know, the K 12 education or, you know, primary and secondary education, do they also have access to higher education? Are they able to consider thinking about going to higher education or college or university nearby? Or do they have to think about going very far away, like outside of the country or even outside of the cities that they live in? And also various businesses that might influence their idea of what STEM education is or STEM is rather. So community is really the entire ecosystem, which really impacts the student. 
or impacts a person who's involved in in the in STEM education. This student could also be a teacher, a teacher who's working with different resources. For example, if a teacher is working in a rural area with lower resources or with lower socioeconomic um, you know, status students, and so the teacher has to think about different ways to approach education in that particular setting, or maybe the teacher has a lot of access to resources. And so how do you navigate having too much, too many resources and being able to channel that into the classroom so that students are not necessarily overwhelmed, but they have the right amount of information to learn. So this is the, you can think about the community as also an ecosystem that involves different factors or externalities that impact how um, a person, either uh, a teacher teaches STEM or how a student learns STEM, or even how a center is developed. Right. So I'm going to go through a couple of slides in the next few and uh, in the next few slides, rather, I'm going to go a couple of points and information that you would need to incorporate into your STEM programming to make sure that the community is addressed. And this is very much, it'll be um, similar to what Mohammed as well as Peter also mentioned or have talked about. So hopefully it'll reinforce a lot of the conflict, uh, uh, sorry, concepts. But at the same time, I also want to have um, some time for reflection. So I put, put in some time for reflection after each slide. So we either we can chat about it or you can even write it in your notes or in your notebook. All right, so Peter spoke about this quite extensively and I just wanted to recap. So first is that you should really think you should really do a needs assessment. You should think about who is your audience and coming back to that mindfulness exercise that we did. Oftentimes we don't even sit in our own environments or where we're sitting right now from home and think about what is it that's surrounding us and what is it that may be impacting our day. And so really thinking through it's like, who is the community that we're working with? Who is this audience? Who are the students? Who are the parents? Who are the other community members that might influence STEM education? So all of this needs to be taken into account. Also looking into the, um, the different community professions that are um, in the area. What are the students seeing every day? Are they seeing, you know, um, STEM professionals, you know, wearing white lab coats and going to labs or going to hospitals? Are they seeing, you know, maybe more alternative or more traditional type of careers like blacksmiths, which is also using a lot of STEM education or STEM rather in their professions? Both are valid and both in both ways you can learn STEM education. So I think it's very important to highlight the different professions or the professionals that are in the area. Also thinking through the resources, as I mentioned in the in the previous slide, is thinking through the resources, what type of resources are available in the community? Are there libraries? Are there you know museums, science museums? But even if they're not, is there, you know, gardens, is there agricultural land? Is there, you know, other um, you know, environmental areas like even like rocks or mountains that can be explored and that can be used in um, in STEM education. And so the resources in the in the community and the environment are also very important to tap into. And and then thinking through the levels of education, you know, what is available to the student in that particular area? Is it only primary and secondary education? Do they have access to higher education, vocational education? What type of education do their parents have or to their other community members have? Because all of this will influence how they're learning STEM and what are what prior knowledge they already have on STEM, the informal knowledge that they have. And I talked about this, this SES, the social economic status of students kind of ties in with the resources and then language is spoken. You know, a lot of, um, you know, communities speak different languages and, you know, even within one community, you have different languages that are spoken and so much of STEM uh, education, you know, from math education to STEM education really builds on the informal knowledge that students bring to any type of um, STEM learning and, at, you know, seeing how we could potentially bridge some of these gaps by connecting concepts, STEM concepts or math concepts to informal knowledge or, you know, concepts that they've learned in their local languages. And then also thinking through inclusion, you know, are we making sure that we're including both boys and girls is, you know, into um, giving them opportunities? Are we also making sure that certain marginalized groups are not not included in um, in STEM education just to make sure that everyone has the opportunity also to make it um, 
despite a student's ability that they also have access and they're also learning. So these are different things to consider. This is a very, um, this is, it's not limited to this list rather. You can also include other um, ideas or thoughts to this, but this is just to kind of get us thinking through, okay, what is in the community? Who are the people that we're working with? Um, what are their backgrounds? What are their worldviews? And how does that play into how we develop STEM programs? All right, so then I just wanted to stop for a second and ask if there's any questions or thoughts or if you wanted to reflect on this. And I'll like give about 30 seconds before we move to the next slide. Okay, I'll move to the next slide. I think everyone has um, probably reflected on this quite a bit already today. Okay, so the second step is thinking about marketing, quote unquote, marketing and reach out. So what's the best way to reach out about STEM programs? And in each community, information or the transfer of information or knowledge flow is very different. And so thinking through what works best in that community, whether it's media, whether it might be TV or radio or other media, if there's, you know, if flyers are much more effective, like putting flyers up on, you know, community walls or um, grocery stores or other shopping areas. And some communities, WhatsApp is really popular because WhatsApp messages get forwarded very quickly. Um, in other communities, door to door might be um, more valuable, really uh, making sure that everybody is aware of these different types of programs or STEM programs that are available to students or even things like loudspeaker announcements, which I've seen in some countries. So this is just kind of thinking through how can we reach out to communities and what's the best way to, um, to reach out to them. Again, it's not limited to this list. You can add to this list, but these are just some ideas to take into consideration. So after this, I'm also gonna ask for any questions or reflections. If anybody wants to um, put it in the chat or to reflect on this, you can write it down as well. Or here's a question for you in, in the communities that you work with, what's the best way to reach out to students and parents to inform them about STEM programs? If you feel like you want to put it in the chat, you can put it in the chat, or you can also just write it down for yourself. Okay, Marbella says uh, social media through Facebook and Instagram. Okay, great. That's one thing I didn't put in my list. That's very good. Social media marketing. Okay, great. And Binot says, in our case, we can approach local governments that are recently formed or are committed to make changes in school education. Okay, that's great. Justin says, still working on the best way, but we found out reaching out through teachers as intermediary, intermediaries works really well. Yeah, that's true. In, teachers are usually a really good way to disseminate information. Anything else? Yeah, I think that Facebook, just like WhatsApp, is also really popular in many countries, and I think it's a really good way to disseminate information. Can we get one more thought before we move on? And feel free to unmute yourselves if you don't want to chat. Bella asks, how much time might be recommended for this process to take place? Yeah, I think the, the community outreach um, or re reaching out to communities or marketing, it really depends, but I would give it, it depends on the community, but I think I would give it between four to six weeks. That's been pretty standard in some of the other programs that I've seen. And in some cases, it takes a little bit longer. It depends on what type of information access there is. Yeah, of course, Marbella. All 
Okay. So we can let's go to the next slide um, unless there's any other final thoughts and I will record that as well. Okay. All right. So step three that I have is on curriculum development. And so this is where we take into account what we found in the needs assessment, as well as understanding who our community members are, you know, the audience that we spoke about or that we um, that we talked about in step one. So thinking about the audience, what their education levels are, what their STEM backgrounds might be, languages that they speak, um, thinking through their the way that they see the world. And I think we all see the world very differently based on the way that, you know, based on our families, based on our, the languages that we speak. And so taking all of that into consideration, thinking through how we can really contextualize the STEM content fit to that community. And one of the ways that as we're thinking about developing the STEM content or developing the curriculum, one thing that I found very useful in my past experience working on programs is to involve community members, is to really think through um, you know, as in addition to the experts that you might be thinking about working with, the STEM education experts or uh, curriculum developers, pedagogy or, you know, experts or teachers, it's also interesting to involve community members because they can tell you about, you know, you know, different professions that are happening in the community that involve STEM that students could potentially explore. Um, in their in their curriculum or in their studies. And what's really nice is that because they see it every day, it really helps them to connect STEM content to something that they pass on the way to school every day. If they see a blacksmith, for example, or if they see a hospital, or if they see, uh, you know, an IT center, and they're wondering what are all these people doing, you know, going in, you know, with a laptop or whatever it is, it just helps them to connect what they're learning in their programming to their surroundings. And that really uh, strengthens their learning. So, in addition to involving community members in the development of uh, STEM content, or even in the curriculum development, and it's not that the community members have to be there from stage one, you could have teachers working with curriculum developers and other pedagogy experts uh, to kind of put the backbone together of a curriculum or even start to put pieces together and then bring in community members almost through like focus groups or even like presentations where they're allowed to give feedback on the curriculum. And I found that that's very useful and they they actually have really great input because they're able to um, even explain, uh, you know, certain words that they use in, you know, in, in their language or concepts that they talk about at home, whether it's, you know, um, you know, with cooking, you know, saying like half or three fourths, the way that they explain it to their children might be very different from the way that we formally explain it in the classroom. So just to capture those experiences is so valuable. And then also introducing community professions. You know, each community has different professions that, you know, that, that, you know, use STEM um, and people have lots of informal knowledge on STEM as well as formalized um, and more systematic um, kind of approaches to STEM. But I think all different professions that use STEM uh, is, you know, it's extremely important for children to our students to be introduced to. And the reason why I mentioned this is. You know, I have a background. My background is in indigenous knowledge. That's what I did for my dissertation. And in indigenous knowledge, what we notice is that a lot of knowledge was unfortunately lost, you know, historically through colonization or through other, um, you know, uh, modernization processes. But at the same time, we still, you know, if you think about if you have a cold, what's the very first thing you do? You think, you know, not all of us, but some of us say, okay, what, what is it that my grandmother used to do to help me treat my cold? And so a lot of that is scientific knowledge or knowledge, informal knowledge that's been passed from generation to generation in families, in communities that, you know, sometimes bypasses a school system or bypasses the formal scientific communities, but is because it's passed on, whether it's you know, something that's um, helpful, or maybe it's something that's not helpful. It's really important for students to understand, okay, here's a scientific concept. Here is what, you know, something that's been passed in my family is something that we can continue using, like the use of turmeric, for example, which is very um, used quite a bit in South Asia, or, you know, other harmful practices. Unfortunately, I've seen quite a few harmful practices in my research you know, um, for example, putting babies to sleep in some areas, they, 
um, they take a flame and they put it very close to the eyelashes, which is extremely dangerous. And so that's a harmful practice. And that scientific practice should actually not be passed on from generation to generation. So really building on the local knowledge or what the communities already know is helpful in both of those ways, because there's some knowledge that we do want to continue passing on from generation to generation and other knowledge that we that we would like to correct or we'd like to stop at certain points. So thinking through that, um, you know, the community professions are very important to highlight and help helping students to understand these are the scientific concepts or mathematical concepts, and here's what is already in my community. Here's what I can build on, or maybe I should, you know, help to, um, you know, take away certain um, ideas that have been passed around or passed by generation. And in that sense, also acknowledging local knowledge is very important because, you know, oftentimes scientific concepts or mathematical concepts are passed on in local knowledge. And when a child goes to, um, whether it's a program or even in a formal school system, they're often taught in a language that's not their local language. And then immediately there's a disconnect in their understanding of, of a scientific concept or a mathematical concept. So thinking through how language can actually bridge scientific concepts or mathematical concepts to strengthen the understanding um, of these concepts for students is important. And just kind of going back, I actually mentioned this in the community professions, but to also acknowledge local culture, traditions, informal knowledge, which are, you know, everything that, you know, uh, Vygotsky and, you know, even Piaget, you know, before him, I know that there are some differences between the two. And I apologize if, if these are um, names you're unfamiliar with, but it, they're scholars that, you know, have, you know, in, in the field of education that have really spoken about how students come into the classroom and it's not an empty vessel or a bucket um, that they're bringing in, but they already have a bucket full of knowledge that they're bringing in. And sometimes it's not, it's not, um, it's so informal that it's not necessarily uh, in the right sequence, or it might be a misunderstanding or misconception. But when they when they come to school, it really gives us an opportunity for the help for us to help them sort it out. So then they they're able to you know make it much more concrete and move on with it. And that's one of the reasons why addressing some of these local knowledge, local cultural traditions, or even informal knowledge students bring to a program or to a formal school system is very important because it also helps them to straighten out maybe understand misunderstandings they may have on STEM or even in math and then help them to strengthen their conceptual understanding um, by exposing them to um, different ways of understanding it. So this is the last step I actually have. So I'll, I'll um, just so that we have time for reflection, we have about 10 minutes left. So I want us to reflect on this and then I'll open it up for questions. So any thoughts or ideas about this or um, any questions about curriculum development? Or just thinking through the communities that you work with. You know, how would you develop the curriculum for them, or how would you think of thinking of, think about developing a STEM program for them? What are some things that you have to take into consideration? Is it language? Um, is it uh, you know maybe parents' backgrounds, or is it the resources that are around? Things like that. I know it's been a long <laughs> last, I mean, there are a lot of information and it's always difficult to reflect on the last presentation, but any thoughts that you have? You can also unmute yourselves if you'd like. I'll stop sharing so that we can see each other. We can, we can see each other's squares.
you, Marbella. You have um, for students in our context, something that is important is job placement in the future. How STEM, STEM education might help in the future. That's an excellent point, Marbella. And I think that a lot of um, students that I've also worked with, they don't know what an engineer does, or they don't know what a scientist, you know, a research scientist does. And I think really introducing those professions is is important and helping them understand that they have. Um, uh, kind of they they have the ability to also be in those in those type of um, positions as well and figuring out maybe how to work with the private sector or other industries to help them with the job placement. Right, I think uh, Justin, did you have a question? Or do you have a comment? No, not at the moment, really. You just said see each other, so I switched on a camera. But I'm. Oh, okay. No worries. <laughs> nothing at the moment. It's good to see you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Gulnara. Yeah, I could, I would also take account into consideration resources. Um, mm -hmm. So that when we teach, we actually have. I think we lost you. Yeah, I think Gulnar, I think your audio is going in and out a little bit. I think it, I see a little triangle too near your name. You might have a connect a connectivity problem. Can you try one more time? Okay. Um, I would probably take into account all the resources. Uh, they come to the classroom, uh, to the STEM hub. Uh, they, they are able also to um, extend the activities after class when they work with their peers. They either have access uh, uh, to those so of adapt. Okay, I think I think I got the gist of your uh, your comment, Goldar, and I'll just rephrase for everyone. I I think you were saying that the resources are very important to take into consideration, and I. I think you're saying that if also if students come with different resources to the classroom, kind of taking that into consideration as well. Is that what you're saying? Yes, okay. Yeah, that, that's a very good point too. And in, in terms of curriculum development, especially when we're you know, thinking through STEM hubs where we may be also working with different communities, that's, that's an excellent point. And each community might have different resources. How do you take that into consideration when students come together? That's an excellent point. And I think one of the ways to address that or to tackle that is to, um, Mohammed mentioned this, and we'll be having a, a longer session on this next week, is to um, use universal design for learning so that we have different ways of engaging with students. Um, despite what type of prior knowledge or background information that they're coming with. So hopefully next Monday, we can talk about that in more detail. Okay, and Marbella says, I wonder if curriculum development can also help create and appreciate or and appreciate trade work and the skill work work versus acknowledging more formal STEM work. Yes, I think that's really important. There's actually a program that World Learning worked on in I think 2004, 2005, I helped to write a paper for it when I was working on my PhD. And the, the program was a program in Ethiopia. And what was really interesting about this is that it was a STEM program and they, they really wanted students in rural Ethiopia to not necessarily have to think that they have to leave their towns or their, where they're located to become a STEM professional. So they were actually um, introducing a lot of the local STEM concepts as well as other indigenous knowledge and local knowledge, including professionals 
that um, that were um, that where students could also have an alternate job. It's not that they had to leave their cities, you know, whether if a small town or cities to go somewhere else to work, so they could actually help to build up the communities that they were that they were in. So I, I do think that, you know. Um, the, uh, you know, appreciating trade work and other types of professions in STEM is equally important um, and, you know, strengthening their conceptual knowledge in STEM will help them to strengthen that type of work as well. Indra Mani asks about arts and STEM education. I think this is also very important too. a lot of communities, you know, when in their in their local knowledge and their culture is. Um, is, you know, you know, it's either through some type of art, you know, it could be through storytelling or through music or theater or other areas. So I think that we can definitely, you know, um, build on that too in community engagement and also in the outreach as well, depending upon how you would like to outreach or reach out to the community. I don't know, Indra, uh, Mani, did you want to speak a little bit more about the arts in STEM education? We'll talk a little bit more about this next week. I think you're on mute. Let me see if I can unmute you. Desi, you are muted. Sorry. Uh... So, actually, I have put on that question, uh, what about integrating arts in STEM education? Actually, we have been practicing this arts, uh, integration of arts in STEM education in our Katman uh, And uh, I think uh, this arts dimension may help uh, students as well as STEM scholars uh, to uh, view STEM from <clears throat> empathetic view. Like uh, what we have found is that <clears throat> sometimes STEM education is too much um, uh, uh, like um, non-humanistic. Sometimes we feel in that way, uh, though I should not tell in that way, but uh, some uh, kind of materialistic uh, uh, from, from that we actually experience. That's why if arts education is integrated out there, students can and scholars can actually mingle around, mingle to each other, mix to each other. They uh, actually uh, find their, um, uh, understand their feelings, uh, uh, how students are working, how they are feeling, uh, like uh, just Deepa told, using storytelling or music or creative arts, fine arts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's why actually I'm um, putting this question out here. Thank mm -hmm. you. I think yeah. uh, Mr. Binod Prasad Pant can uh, uh, more elaborate because he's doing his PhD uh, and uh, he's working much uh, in this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. Th those, those are all really great points. And Binod, I know that you are also an expert in this area. So I really, um, next yeah. week when we have your um, discussion on this, I would love to hear um, your thoughts about it as well. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, sure, of course. Thank you. So we have about, I think about two minutes left. If there's any other last minute points, or if you want to put something in the chat or even, um, Questions, you can unmute yourselves. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, I wanted to thank everybody for, you know, listening to this presentation and, you know, for all of us, you know, for my other two colleagues as well, for Mohammed and Peter, I think that they gave a really good groundwork um, foundation for for what I was going to discuss. And hopefully the, what I did was more of a reflection for you so you could integrate a lot of the work that you, uh, or a lot of the information that you've been presented to on today. And we look forward to seeing you again. I think I'll leave it to Haley to close out.
Hi everyone. Um, I want to echo what Deepa said. Thank you all so much for joining us and a huge thank you to Mohammed, Peter and Deepa for starting off our training series so well. Um, I'm excited to go through the next three days. Um, they will take place this Thursday, next Monday and the following Thursday. Uh, the agendas for each meeting are in 